Good morning, church. All right, so sermon text this morning is Mark 8, 31 through Mark 9, verse 1. If you would, out of respect for God's word, let's go ahead and stand for this morning's scriptures reading. Hear the word of the Lord. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. All right, would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father, we ask that during this time where we hear the preaching of your word, we ask that you would open our minds and hearts to receive what you have for us, that we would receive your words with confidence and faith, and we pray that we would not be ashamed of what you have to say about who you are and what you have come to do. We pray that you would illumine our minds and hearts to receive it, that you would give us clarity to understand it, that you would give us a renewed zeal to apply it, and a commitment to follow you. We ask that you would help us to understand your gospel aright and what it truly means to follow you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hypothetically speaking, if there were a football game next weekend, all right, just pretend, okay, just for the sake of the illustration, if there were a culturally significant sporting event next weekend, and one of your friends invited you over to watch the game, you would obviously have certain expectations about what type of sport you would be watching. And your expectations would be rooted in your understanding of what exactly football entailed. Most of us, as good red-blooded Americans, if we were invited to a football game next weekend, would be expecting a very specific type of sport. But we need to recognize that our understanding of what football is, is determined by many things. You see, if we were in any other country in the world, the mention of football would have them thinking of a completely different game. Because our different understandings of what football is are shaped by our respective cultures, history, and geographical locations. And so, if you were to accept the invitation to this said football game next weekend, and you arrived at your, let's say, soon-to-be ex-friend's house, <laughs> and you walked in to see a game on the TV that we Americans call soccer, you would know that there was a huge misunderstanding. And this misunderstanding had led to your expectations being misplaced. Now, it's a, a silly example, but I think it illustrates a very important point. Our understanding of what a thing is, and so many things, is often shaped by our culture, our place in history, and our own experiences. And these misunderstandings can lead to misplaced expectations. I introduced these concepts to us this morning because in our text, Jesus is going to teach us about foundational truths of the Christian faith. And yet, as we will see, these truths ran directly against prominent messianic expectations of that day. In the first century AD, there were numerous Jewish factions, each of which had their own understanding of what the Messianic age would bring. 
The Zealots were a militant faction that looked forward to the coming of a Messiah who would lead them to military victory against their Roman oppressors. The Pharisees, the conservative religious lay people of that day, were looking forward to a Messiah who, yes, would uh, destroy all who ruled unjustly, but also who would punish and condemn all the sinners while gathering the righteous to himself. We know anything about the Pharisees? That sounds about right. The Sadducees, as the liberal ruling elite of their day, not only rejected a large portion of God's word, but also didn't give much thought to a Messiah. They were satisfied with their societal power and influence. While the Essenes, a sect of priestly outcasts who had retreated to the Judean wilderness, were waiting for at least two messiahs who would, among other things, one might say, own the libs. That is to say, the Essenes were looking forward to a messiah that would come and destroy that corrupt, liberal, Sadducean establishment. And then there was a small group of 12 Jewish men who had pinned their hopes on the man Jesus of Nazareth, among whom there were doubtless many expectations of what the Christ would do and what that meant and, it, what, and what it meant to follow him. But among all of these groups, including Christ's own disciples, there was a common understanding informed in some measure by their fleshly minds that looked forward to a political Messiah who would rule in power who would destroy the earthly enemies of Israel and liberate the nation from the Roman oppressors. And I think we can see how the experience of Israel at that point in history, firmly under the boot of imperial rule, somehow influenced the people of Israel at that time to neglect certain aspects of what their Messiah would be while embracing other aspects of his ministry. And I think this serves as a warning to us as Christians. Even though we as the church would like to believe that we have been uninfluenced by our culture and current experiences, and that we are devoted to the words of our Lord in purity and in their entirety, one glance at the modern church tells us that this is not the case. So often, as Seth mentioned last week, even though we understand that Jesus is the Christ, our understanding of what that means and the claim that that truth makes on our lives can be fuzzy or even distorted. And yet I do not believe that we are destined to misunderstand God's revealed will. I believe that the glorious truth of the gospel and the simplicity and purity of the Christian life can accurately be known by his people. The Lord Jesus Christ gave his first disciples the clarity to truly understand his truth. He was able to overcome their warped and fuzzy understanding and I believe he can and will do the same for us. In spite of the cultural waters that we swim in and our own personal experiences and differing backgrounds, we can, as one body, rejoice in the right understanding of Christ's gospel and truly understand what it means to follow him and that we might do that together. In our study of Mark so far up to this point, up to the point of Peter's confession, which happened in last week's text, the question that Mark has wanted us to ask has been, who is this man? By presenting to his readers the mighty works of Jesus, Mark has wanted us to contemplate Jesus's identity. And in last week's text, Peter, when asked by our Lord, who do you say that I am, gave the proper answer. He said, you are the Christ. And this is the confession that Mark wants all of his readers to heartily affirm. In Peter's confession, Christ is identified rightly as the long-awaited messianic king. But from this point forward, starting in our text this morning, Mark is going to shift our focus. Moving forward in the gospel, the new question that Mark will pose to us as his readers is, but what does that mean? What does it mean for Jesus to be the Christ? What does it mean to follow him? And what is the nature of his kingdom? On their face, these are seemingly simple questions, and yet at the same time, they are profound. The answers to these questions are foundational to our hope as the people of God, and thus the answers to these questions have eternal significance. We'll work through our text this morning in three sections, each of which answers a specific question. 
Mark 8, 31 through 33, we're going to ask, what does it mean for Jesus to be the Christ? Lord willing, we, along with Mark and Peter, all wholeheartedly agree. Jesus is the Christ. Great. What does that mean? What does it mean for Jesus to be the Christ? And then in Mark 8, 34 through 38, we're going to look at what does it mean to be a Christian? So yes, Jesus is the Christ, and he calls us to follow him, to be a Christian. Great. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a Christian? And then finally, in Mark 9, 1, what does it mean that Christ's kingdom was coming? In Mark 9, 1, Jesus tells those standing before him that some who were there would not taste death until they saw the kingdom of God after it had come with power. The kingdom was coming soon. And all of us go, great. What does that mean? Right? So what does it mean that Christ's kingdom was coming? So let's go ahead and take a look at the first section of our text this morning, Mark 8, 31 through 33. What does it mean for Jesus to be the Christ? Now, throughout the gospel, Jesus has made it his custom to teach. He taught the crowds. He taught his disciples, but at this point in the gospel, Jesus, for the first time, teaches the 12 exactly what it means for him to be the Messiah. It says in verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. And unlike other times when Jesus' teaching might have been veiled or cryptic, we are told in verse 32 that what he taught them, he said to them plainly. Now, by way of reminder, I want us to consider the implications of the title, Son of Man, because that's what he calls himself in this text. This is the preferred title that Jesus uses for himself in the Gospel of Mark, and he uses it for himself here as well. And it's clear from the way that he uses it throughout the Gospel that he was rooting his understanding in the, in, of this title in Daniel 7, 13 through 14, where the prophet Daniel records, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. And all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall never be destroyed. I want us to see this right up front because when Jesus uses this title, Son of Man, with reference to himself, it implies some pretty grand realities. The Son of Man has dominion, glory, a kingdom, and the obedience of the nations. And if you were one of his disciples, you put yourself in their shoes at this moment, and Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, I think that would fit into their expectations rather nicely. I could see Peter, he's sitting there. He hears him, you know, he hears Jesus call himself the son of man. He says, all right, you know, Jesus is gonna have eternal dominion. He's gonna have an everlasting kingdom. I'm gonna be right there next to him. Romans are gonna serve us. It's just gonna be awesome. And at this point, we want to affirm that Christ does have eternal dominion and he is the king of God's kingdom. And while the rule of Christ is greater than, P than Peter and the other disciples could have ever imagined, it is the suffering associated with the Messiah's ministry that caused them to malfunction. For as Christ says, the son of man must suffer many things. And Jesus tells us exactly what this suffering will entail he said, he would be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. This is the statement that just did not register for the disciples. It did not compute. How could the son of man, the transcendent, reigning, sovereign son of man suffer? In fact, so incompatible was this idea in the Jewish mind that some Jewish interpreters and Jewish communities to this very day believe in two messiahs, one who reigns and is victorious and another one who suffers and dies a violent death. Because when one looks at Old Testament prophecies referring to the Messiah, the idea of a suffering Messiah become too numerous to ignore. Just to name a few scriptures, Genesis 3.15 speaks of the serpent-crushing seed of the woman who would in turn be bruised in the process. 
Psalm 22 speaks of the seemingly God-forsaken man whose hands and feet are pierced. Zechariah 12.10 speaks of the house of Israel mourning over the one who was pierced as one would mourn for a firstborn son. And of course, Isaiah 53 describes the suffering servant of the Lord who is crushed by God himself and yet as a result redeems God's people. And while the Jewish scribes of the past and present could not conceive of how the reigning Davidic Messiah could possibly be the same as the suffering Messiah, Here in our text, Jesus tells us that in him, both of these messianic truths are fulfilled. The Son of Man must suffer. And so what does it mean to be the Messiah? To be the Messiah is to suffer. And yet the thing I want want to make sure that we don't miss is not simply that the Son of Man would suffer. No, but the Son of Man must suffer. The suffering of Christ that he predicts for the first time right here in our text is a necessity. Why? Why was it necessary for the Son of Man to suffer? Why was it necessary that he be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed? Why was it necessary that he be crucified and die a violent death? I submit to you that there are three reasons. Two underlying reasons and one ultimate reason. The two underlying reasons are God's holiness and our sinfulness, right? So God is absolutely pure and holy. He cannot look upon sin. He cannot tolerate sin. Nothing unclean can ever enter his presence. This is just the nature of who God is. He is pure and good and righteous, but we are not. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one on earth who does good and never sins. Our sins have separated us from him, and our sins have offended the thrice holy God. Now, these two realities, the holiness of God and our own sinfulness, do not in and of themselves make it a necessity for the Messiah to suffer. God is holy, we are sinful, and that could have been the end of the story. He could have in his infinite justice, sent the entire human race straight to hell. And if he did so, he would have been in the right. And if he did so, the Son of Man would have never had to suffer. But that's not the end of the story. Rather, the suffering of the Son of Man became a necessity the moment that God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit ordained in eternity past out of his infinite love and mercy to graciously save sinners. So the ultimate reason, the ultimate reason that the Son of Man had to suffer is rooted in the gracious saving purpose of God. If God was going to save the suffering If God was going to save us, the suffering of the Son of Man was a necessity. The Son of God would have to take on a true human nature. He would have to become the Son of Man. Live a sinless life and then suffer a violent death at the hands of lawless men. And in doing so, he would offer himself as an atonement for sin to purchase from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation a people set apart for God a people saved by grace and washed in his blood. And after doing so, as it says at the end of verse 31, after three days he would rise again from the dead. Therefore, the moment that God ordained in his eternal purpose to graciously save sinners was the moment that the suffering of the Son of Man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, became an unchanging, unalterable necessity so that all who would turn from their sin and trust in him would have eternal life. So what does it mean for Jesus to be the Christ? It means that Jesus came to accomplish the eternal plan of God to save sinners by suffering on a cross for their sin. That's what it means for Jesus to be the Christ. And yet it is this very concept, the concept of a suffering Messiah that runs directly against Peter's understanding of what his Messiah 
should be and do. Instead, Peter, as we see in our text, recoils at the thought of a suffering Messiah. From what we know about the disciples' hopes and dreams for the future, they were looking forward to the earthly benefit that came with having close ties with Israel's Messiah. <clears throat> they wanted earthly authority and influence. The Messiah's suffering didn't fit into that plan. And so what Peter does next, as we see in verse 32, is he takes Jesus aside and begins to rebuke him, which I think is quite bold, seeing that the Lord, your self-professed Messiah, just told you what must happen. And yet Peter decides that he knows better. He knows better than God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as, what to, as, as to what the Messiah should be and do. But this is because Peter, as it says in verse 33, was setting his mind on the things of man. And in a sense, I believe that Peter, out of pride, did not want to be associated with such a Messiah. As a result, Peter was ashamed of Christ and his words. And that is why he rebuked Christ. And this is just evidence. This is just evidence that while Peter, like the blind man from last week's text, had been given eyes to see that Jesus was indeed the Christ, his understanding of what that entailed was still fuzzy and distorted. He had yet to receive the clarity to fully understand what Christ had come to do. Because of this, Christ needed to rebuke Peter sharply. He needed to put his apostle back in his place. But in Christ's rebuke, we get a hint that there is more happening in this encounter than we first thought. Because whether or not Peter was aware of it, by standing in opposition to God and his word and speaking to dissuade the Messiah from going to his death, Peter was functioning on behalf of Satan himself to tempt Christ into forsaking his God-given er, God ministry. And so it says in Mark 8.33 that Christ, turning to see his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. In Jesus' response to Peter's rebuke, we see that Christ is acutely aware of where Peter's objection is ultimately coming from. Yes, Peter may have said it, and he might have said it because he was motivated by his worldly thinking, but Christ recognizes it immediately as a temptation from the very pit itself. And so when Jesus turns to see his disciples, those placed under his authority and care, he stands in the gap and rebukes Peter publicly. You know, I find it interesting, it's not said in this uh, account, but in Matthew, P uh, Jesus comes out and says, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna die. And, and Peter comes back and he says, this shall surely not happen to you. I mean, I don't know about you, but that's awfully close to you shall not surely die. That sounds a whole lot like serpent talk to me. <laughs> and yet, and yet what does Jesus do? Recognizes the serpent, sees those under his authority and care, his bride, if you will, his Eve, and as the new Adam, he steps in between and he says, get behind me, Satan. Our Adam succeeds. So both for the good of his other disciples and Peter as well, Christ cannot and will not be deterred from the mission that God has given him. For he has set his face like a flint towards Jerusalem, where the Son of Man must suffer and die for the sins of the world. Now this brings us to our second question this morning in Mark 8, 34 through 38. What does it mean to be a Christian? In our first point this morning, we looked at what it meant for Jesus to be the Christ, and we found that the Messiah's mission of redemption would be accomplished by walking the path of shame, suffering, rejection, and death. And while Peter and the other disciples may have initially recoiled at the idea of such a Messiah, they are yet to learn that they too, along with all those who follow Christ, must walk a similar path. And this is what Christ addresses in Mark 8, 34 through 38. <clears throat> Now, while Jesus had been teaching his disciples privately concerning his sufferings, at this point, in the text says that he called the crowd to him with his disciples and said to them, if anyone would follow me. This indicates that what Jesus was about to say does not simply apply to the apostles. 
This doesn't just apply to super Christians. What Christ is about to teach the crowd applies to anyone and everyone who wants to be a Christian. And here Christ describes the very nature of the Christian life. Jesus says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Biblical faith is a faith that follows. And so what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does that look like? Well, he tells us in verse 34, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so Jesus says to the crowd, to his disciples and to Peter, if anyone is going to be my disciple, if anyone is going to follow me, he needs to, first of all, deny himself. And now this is a call to renounce or disown oneself. In case you're wondering what it looks like to deny someone, one need only look to the end of Mark's gospel, because this is the same word that is used to describe what Peter does to Christ. Peter denies Christ. And what did that look like? Well, when asked whether or not he, he was Christ's disciple, whether he was associated with or a follower of Jesus, Peter disowned Christ. He renounced Christ. He denied Christ and said, I don't even know who that man is. And yet, ironically, what Christ is telling Peter, as well as the rest of us here in our passage, is that the object of our denial should not be Christ, but ourselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so when Christ tells us to deny ourselves, we need to understand that as a radical renunciation of our earthly life. Right? A radical renunciation of our earthly life and a shift in our ultimate allegiance from ourselves and our will to the will of God in identification with Christ. It is a call to step down from the makeshift thrones that we have constructed for ourselves to take off our silly paper crowns and bow the knee to the true King, Jesus Christ. Another way to put this is that to deny oneself is a fundamental shift from a heart that cries out, I am Lord, my will be done, to a heart that cries out, Christ is Lord, his will be done. It is to turn from self-rule to the rule of King Jesus. And not only are we told to deny ourselves and identify with the Lord Jesus, but we are also commanded to take up our cross. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, this is the first time that the cross is actually mentioned in Mark's gospel. Although Christ mentioned the fact that he was going to be killed back in verse 31, he did not tell us how that was going to happen. Though we know now that the cross was the means by which that would come about. But that just means that when we consider the imagery of the cross in this passage and we consider how the original audience would have heard this command, we cannot Christianize it. We cannot, uh, we need to understand culturally what the image of the cross meant to the original audience. The original audience, to them, the cross was a terrible means of torture and execution sanctioned by the Roman state. And once again, for the disciples who are ultimately looking forward to the overthrow of the Roman state, they've got to be thinking, pick up my cross. Jesus, what on earth are you talking about? You see, the Jewish audience listening to Jesus didn't associate the cross with salvation. They saw the image of the cross as an image of hostile opposition, of shame, suffering, and death. And this is the key, that understanding is the key to understand what Jesus is commanding us to do. If we want to follow him, we need to understand that in this life, we should expect to experience the, oppo uh, the opposition of the world the reproach of men, a life filled with suffering and even death for the sake of Christ and his gospel. But why? Why would a person opt for such a life? And Jesus says it's because those who lose their lives, those who deny themselves and take up their cross and follow Jesus, gain a greater and more lasting type of life. As Jesus says in verse 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And this is the choice that we all have. 
We can either save our life, and by that Jesus means we can retain lordship over our own life, seek to preserve our worldly existence, to accumulate for ourselves the pleasures and possessions that this world has to offer, to live in comfort, fully accepted by those who hate God and his word, right? Christ says that if you do this, you're going to lose your life. You're going to forfeit eternal life. Those who seek to save their lives in this way will end up in hell. Or, Jesus says, you can lose your life for the sake of him and for the sake of his gospel. Now what this looks like for each person to lose their life is going to vary. What it means to apply this principle for the person living in the United States in 2024 is going to look a lot different than what it may have looked like for the first century Christians in Rome who were facing the wild beasts or even some of our persecuted brothers and sisters in other countries. And doubtless, what it looks like for each of us individually is going to vary person to person depending on what your life situation is and what God is calling you to do. But the calling is the same in a general sense for all of us. We are called to let go. We are called to let go of this life, to embrace Christ and his gospel, turn from our sin and submit to King Jesus. And as we do that, we must be willing to bear the opposition, shame, suffering, and death that it might bring whatever that might look like. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to follow Christ. And Christ assures us that it is worth it because in doing so, we gain our lives. Now in verse, uh, verses 36 and 37, Christ asks two questions in order to give us some perspective. He says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? You see, as I said before, we're all faced with a choice. We could seek to preserve the life we have here and lose our soul, or we can lose our life here and save it. But what Christ wants us to consider is the actual value of our souls. He's basically saying that your, your pursuit of this world is not even close to worth it. How often do we clamor to attain the things of this world? In fact, Christ says that you could actually succeed in gaining the entire world, but if in the process you lose your soul, it would profit you nothing. And yet, how often do we treat the fate of our soul as a trivial thing? when it should be the very thing we seek to preserve above all else. It is more valuable than anything in this world, and yet men throw it away as if it were worthless. And yet when we understand the value of our very soul, it helps us to keep things in perspective. Even for those of us who have embarked on this journey of following Christ, whether it was recently or long ago, we still face the challenges of cross-bearing and self-denial every day. And these probing questions that Christ asks can still help us have the proper mindset regarding our Christian walk. So when we are tempted to seek after the things of this world, we need to compare them to the worth of our very soul. Is the craving for the praise of other people worth more than your soul? Is that relationship worth more than your soul? Is your worldly comfort and ease worth more than your soul? Is the accumulation of worldly goods worth more than your soul? It's not. And yet so often we can act like it is. And so I would encourage us all to pray that God might give us a proper heart in this matter, that we might see Christ and what he has to offer us as what it truly is, infinitely more valuable than anything we can gain in this world. If there's anything in our lives that we are clinging to in a way that is not pleasing to the Lord, we need to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and let that thing go. The final statement of Christ in chapter eight, verse 38, describes the fate of all those who are ashamed of Christ and his words. For, whatever, or for whoever is ashamed of me, and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And I think this saying of Christ really just highlights this fact. 
someone is always going to be ashamed of you. Someone is going to be ashamed of you. There's no escaping that reality. And this is what Peter needed to understand, and this is what we need to understand as well. You can either embrace Christ and his word, deny yourself and follow him, in which case you bear the reproach of this world. This world, perhaps your friends and family will be ashamed of you because you follow Christ, or you can deny Christ, and he will be ashamed of you on the last day. Someone is going to be ashamed of you. The choice is who? Because even though, as we read in verse 31, that the Son of Man was destined to suffer and die, this, would, this was only part of his ministry as the Messiah. And while Peter and the other disciples were looking for a ruler to reign in power, their expectations were far too low. Because after his suffering and death, God the Father raised Jesus from the dead and seated him on the very throne of God. And he will descend, he will descend from that throne one day to judge all those who were ashamed of him and his word. And this leads us to our last question this morning in Mark 9.1. What does it mean that Christ's kingdom was coming? For the majority of our text this morning, Christ has been teaching not only about his suffering and death, but also about the suffering associated with the Christian life. And while Christ briefly mentioned his second coming in Mark 8.38, he speaks of a more imminent coming of the kingdom in Mark 9.1. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And so while the disciples who were expecting that Christ would rule in power may have been thrown off by this talk of suffering, here Christ assures them that there is a powerful event concerning the kingdom of God that will happen within the lifetime of some of those standing there with him. The only question is, what is he talking about? Um, there, there are different options about what exactly Christ is referring to in this verse. And if you disagree on the one that I choose, we can have a conversation and you can convince me otherwise because I'm not gonna hold this too, too tightly. All right, there's some, some good arguments on, on either side of this discussion. Um, and yet the one thing we know for sure is that whatever this kingdom of God coming with power is, it happened in the lifetime of some of those standing with Jesus. And so we can be sure that what he's not talking about is the second coming where he comes to judge the living and the dead at the end of time. Now there's at least three views as to what exactly Christ is referring to in this verse. Some would say that it refers to the transfiguration that the, that's recorded in the very next passage. That's very popular interpretation. Um, though I find it hard to believe, given the fact that Jesus says, there are some standing here who will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Uh, I think it's a strange way to refer to an event that happens six days later, right? I think they're, they're pretty much still all alive, right? So I, I don't know if that really makes sense. And so... So whenever this event took place, it needed to be within the lifespan of some, but not all of those present in Mark 9.1. Uh, the second option uh, for when this powerful coming of the kingdom took place would be the destruction of the Jer Jerusalem temple in AD 70 by the Romans. And um, people who, who hold this position would say that this is a judgment from God upon the nation, which happened within that generation. Jesus showed up and judged those who rejected him. Um, though I've heard some good arguments for that, um, but I don't think that's what Jesus has in mind when he promised the disciples the powerful coming of the kingdom. Rather, I think it's better to see Mark 9.1 as, re as referring to the same event promised in Mark 1.15 when Jesus declared the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? So I think that he's still talking about the same thing. Also, the underlying Greek grammar in this passage uh, seems to speak not of a single event concerning the kingdom, but a lasting period of the kingdom's existence that would be characterized by power. That is to say, the disciples would not simply see a single kingdom event that would be characterized by power, but rather they would experience the kingdom present in a new and powerful way. And I think that this was brought about by the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of the Son of God and was evident starting on the day of Pentecost. So that's, that would be my, my position. 
Um, and, I, and I say this because uh, these events are explicitly characterized by power and mark a major turning point in the course of redemptive history in the lifetime of some of those standing with Jesus in Mark 9.1. If you recall, Judas will not make it to the day of Pentecost because he took his own life prior to the crucifixion. And so only some of those standing there will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. But it was on the day of Pentecost when the resurrected Jesus, who had been declared to be the Son of God in power by means of his resurrection, and who by means of that same mighty power had been seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, far above every rule and authority, and it was on that day that he poured out the Spirit of God upon his people and clothed them with power from on high that they might bear witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe that from that point forward, the gospel has been advancing in power and God has been powerfully transforming the hearts and lives of men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Remember, what's the son of man get? Obedience of the nations. And I think that's what's happening here. And as the gospel goes forth and men and women are called to follow Jesus Christ, the enthroned son of man, provides his people with the Holy Spirit that they might truly understand the gospel and that they might be strengthened to deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow him. And we see no better example of this reality than the transformation of the apostle Peter. Seth mentioned this briefly last week. Um, when Peter first heard of the Son of Man and that the Son of Man had to suffer, Peter recoiled and was ashamed of this truth. He said, no way. No way is my Messiah a suffering Messiah. And yet on the day of Pentecost, Peter stands up and boldly proclaimed that the death of Christ was a vital aspect of God's eternal plan. And without shame, he proclaimed that not no way, no, but that there was no other way that sinners could be saved except through the death of the suffering son of man. And Peter, who had denied the Lord, who had denied the Lord to avoid the cross in Mark 14, would deny himself and eventually be crucified in Rome for the sake of Christ and his gospel. While I was writing this sermon um, on Friday night, I was in the offices here at the church and some of the brothers and sisters were meeting in the fellowship hall for our Freedom That Lasts ministry. And though they didn't know it, they had an eavesdropping audience in the other room, hearing them sing praises to God, which was a real blessing. One of the songs that they were singing, I believe it was Do Lord, you guys sing Do Lord on Friday? Yes, Do Lord, oh Do Lord, do remember me. And one of the verses said, if you don't bear a cross, you can't wear a crown. And I considered that a moment of happy providence. Because I think that line sums up this morning's text rather well. The way of the cross, or the way to the crown is through the cross. The way to life is through death, and the way to honor is through shame. And yes, we believe that Christ reigns in glory, has eternal dominion, and to him shall be the obedience of the nations. The authority that he now has is greater than anything the disciples could have ever dreamed of. And yet, the road to glory was paved with suffering. And as it was for our master, so it will be for us. And so he commands us not to be ashamed of him, not to be ashamed of his words, but rather to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. But we don't make the trek alone. The one who has walked the road before us, who bore his cross to atone for our sin, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was raised on the third day, ascended into heaven, and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father in glory, has given us his spirit so that he might be with us all, every step of the way. So this is, this is my prayer for us this morning, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we might fully understand what Christ has done 
for us and what it truly means to follow him. Because if we bear a cross, we shall surely wear a crown. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand what it means for your son to be the Christ, what that meant in his humiliation and what that meant in his exaltation. And Lord, as we seek to follow him, I pray that you would impress upon our hearts what it truly means to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow him. But that we might keep in our minds the fact that he has provided for us your Holy Spirit to empower us and to help us along the way. I pray that you would impress upon our minds also the glory that awaits us as the one who has gone before us receives us into glory. And we look forward to that day when he comes again. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.